I had to squeeze this in, not least because I mentioned it in the main review, but HTC just launched a tweaked version of the M8 called the M8S with downgraded Snapdragon 615 processor, lower internal storage at 16 gig plus micro SD of course, but with a traditional 13 megapixel stills camera, probably the same decent one as in the Desire Eye. Materials are the same though and the price is dramatically lower, expected at well below £400. HTC are certainly throwing out the hardware at the moment as you'll see. Watch for other news in a catch-up in the next phone show. HTC's mission with the One M9 here was clear. Take everything that critics like me said was wrong with the M7 and M8 and fix it, or at least most of it. To its credit, HTC has succeeded. The One M9 is a terrific top-end smartphone, albeit at a rather crazily high launch price. This turns out to be the otherwise impressive M9's Achilles heel with lower price competition that includes its own sister devices, both old and new. The basics are as before with an aluminium outer shell here, but with a new ridge around the outside. Is it to improve grip? Possibly. For me, the feel in the hand isn't as premium as on the M7 and M8 though. It's just odd. You know it and I know it as knowledgeable enthusiasts that the ridge is part of the design, but an average person just picking it up on the street might easily just think the phone hadn't been finished properly. Hmm. However, the fit and finish generally is tremendous, as you'd expect for well over £550 SIM free in the UK right now. Above and below the screen are the usual top-notch boom sound speakers, which put out high and low frequencies you just don't hear on any other manufacturer's phones. They're not the loudest, but they're very, very hi-fi, and they continue to set the benchmark for every other phone in terms of quality. Bit of Ian Gillen and Deep Purple for you. You can actually hear bass in treble, even though the volume isn't uh, incredible. Very nice though. As before, there's a very slight size penalty to pay for the boom sound speakers, around an extra centimetre, top and bottom, vertically in total. Each speaker needs a certain physical volume around internally in order to develop uh, some of the frequencies that get output. You just can't pack in components there in the same degree as on the average Samsung Galaxy. On the right hand edge is one of the first things that's been fixed. The power and screen lock button is now perfectly placed in the middle of a side rather than being out of reach on the top edge of the design. Well done HTC, even if it took you three years to sort out. Inside, HTC has followed the trend into the world of the Snapdragon 810, despite reported problems by all and sundry on how this can overheat if pushed to the limit. The M9 software throttles the 810 by up to 25% when it's warm as a result uh, to prevent issues, but in that case you then have to wonder, why didn't HTC just go with a Snapdragon 805 or 615 in the first place? <laughs> Performance would have been identical in terms of what the user actually sees and experiences, and the phone would have ended up cheaper to make and to buy. Speaking of temperatures, I have to say I'm recording this in a summer house in bright UK spring sunshine. I just left the HTC One M9 in the, in the sun inside the summer house for about uh, five to ten minutes, and it's very, very hot. Do not leave this device in the sun. Metal phones get hot and they might break. A three gig of RAM inside should be pretty future proof. Also, there's flexibility on the storage front with uh, 32 gig of internal plus micro SD. The M9 is looking like it could have quite a long shelf life, well into 2016 and beyond. Though do note, there's less than 20 gig of that initial 32 actually free out of the box. Shame on HTC for some serious bloat in the sense routines. Mind you, every user will have a fast micro SD, surely. On the shiny aluminium back is another huge change in response to criticism from myself and many others. The low resolution ultra pixel camera has been ditched or at least shifted to the front, of which more in a moment. <laughs> Ditto the gimmicky depth camera, which served the awful, awful clutch that was the U-Focus blurring utility. In their place, a professional 1 over 2.3 inch sensor, 20 megapixel unit that's used a good effect, as you can see here. The optics aren't as high end as those in the iPhone and top Lumias, and there's no OIS, but results in most light conditions will satisfy most normal users, especially because 
photo taking is so fast. Snap anything and everything as fast as you like. Snap a photo burst or just shoot some 4K video. This has to be manually turned on in settings that does then stay on until further notice. And then use the simple capture control at playback time to grab eight megapixel stills. <laughs> Something we're seeing more and more of. This system does work. There is no frame by frame nudge capability. So you can't always get the exact moment you wanted. Add in advanced capture settings, ISO, white balance and exposure, and there really is little to complain about. Yes, I'd like to see an oversampled mode doing more with the abundance of pixels to purify the photos in Nokia style. Yes, I'd like to see faster focusing. Yes, I'd like to have OIS included. Yes, I like a brighter or a proper flash, but I do realise you can't have everything. Together with the ultra pixel front camera, which has finally found its niche, the M9 is certainly a huge leap forward over the disappointing M7 and their rather tragic M8. The form factor, like the iPhone 6 before it, is damn near perfect in terms of smoothness and width. I can wrap my hand right round it securely. In terms of the physical, smartphones do seem to be converging at last on a genuine sweet spot. Part of which is a display in the 5 inch to 5.2 inch range, depending on bezels. The 2013 Galaxy S4 arguably led the way here in terms of introducing 5 inch screens to the masses in a form factor which was eminently manageable. <laughs> and that was two years ago, so size advances do seem to have stopped, at least for the mass market. I was very pleased to see that HTC hasn't been tempted to go down the Quad HD route in terms of resolution. There really is no need at all for Quad HD on a 5 inch full RGB display, however good your eyes are, really. Yes, maybe there's a need for Quad HD with phablet screens and when Pentile AMOLED layouts are involved, but there's no need at all here, and HTC did realise this. <laughs> with just 1080p resolutions to drive, the throttled chipset inside does manage to eat battery life out for a full day, though not much more. Again, what if a Snapdragon 615 had been used inside instead? Oh wait, that's the brand new HTC One M8S mentioned earlier in the news. The M9 runs Lollipop, of course, with HTC Sense 7 editions over the top, and I can report I felt no need whatsoever to mess around by turning things off or disabling services, essentially part of my first 15 minutes with a Samsung TouchWiz-based phone. In fact, I enjoyed most of what HTC has thrown into the mix. Blink feed is now mature and once set up with feeds of your choice provides a super magazine style interface that always has something interesting to dip into. While the virtual navigation buttons are now configurable in that you can not only change their order but also add an extra control, 2012 style, plugged from a larger palette. Themes brings back happy memories of Nokia S60 smartphones a decade ago. Maybe it's harder to theme the all singing, all dancing Android, but HTC seems to have managed it at last, doing a better job than Sony in its recent experience. The theme manager here is first class. Themes take only a few seconds to apply and then bang, it's as if you have a whole new phone in terms of appearance, iconography, sounds and more. Great job, HTC. One innovation worth noting, even though it's comparatively low tech, is the location specific home screen smart folders widget. Essentially, it detects where and when you are, home, work, out and so on, and brings up a suggested and customizable set of application shortcuts. It's a really nice idea that you'd have to live a fairly regimented life in order to benefit very much from it. Peel Smart Remote promises much in conjunction with the uh, infrared window up top here on the M9. Audio Visual Bliss, all controlled from my smartphone. But like every other infrared solution I've tried, nothing works with any of my equipment. It's only a two-year-old TV and an even newer set-top box, and yet the app doesn't like either. Grr. Maybe it's a UK thing, or maybe I'm just jinxed. Finally, Zoe is now the name of the themed slideshow sharing utility. Just pick your snaps or media and let it combine them with music. It's fast and it works but unspectacular in 2015 with a dozen other similar services and options in the mobile world. The Zoe mode that I was so impressed by in the M7 where photos will be taken in the background even before I hit the capture icon <laughs> is long gone, I'm afraid. I suspect that that sort of behavior will be prohibitively expensive in terms of resources with the M9's chipset and the higher resolution camera. Oh well. 
<laughs> I did hit the occasional freeze and bug here, but HTC has pushed two system updates in the last 10 days alone. So there's clearly a lot going on in its software labs and at a frantic pace. Back in 2011, Android smartphones were spread out across the full price spectrum from £30 to £600 and you knew what to expect from the price. You paid more and you got more in rough proportion. But the arrival of first the Google Nexus 5, top specs at £300 or so, then the Motorola Moto G, pretty good specs at less than £150 and now an onslaught of Chinese manufacturers undercutting even Motorola. They've changed the market. The M9 retail SIM free, I kid you not, for around £570 at the moment in the UK. And I really cannot see how HTC can justify this. Yes, you're getting a solid metal design. Yes, you're getting a pair of cracking speakers. But since seven aside, that's about it. In fact, the 2015 Moto G second gen, which I reviewed in the, as the Nexus 6 Lite in Phone Show 246, has an almost identical form factor, albeit in polycarbonate, presents an interface that's very nearly as swish and with similar applications using the same OS, has front facing speakers that aren't much worse. In fact, they're louder, has a camera that's only marginally less capable. You get the picture at a quarter, repeat, a quarter the price. The world has changed and manufacturers can no longer charge this sort of price unless there's a damn good unique selling point or an Apple logo on the back. Samsung will learn ex the exact same lesson with the S6, of course. The One M9 is a splendid piece of hardware, don't get me wrong, a solid smartphone, but it's currently massively overpriced.